Hello, everyone. Um, tonight we're going to get started with uh, John Rawls and a totally new unit of conversation for the class, um, the unit that I've titled Social and Economic Justice. And this is <clears throat> this is kind of our last um, really big unit um, of the quarter. We still have um, that last little module on success in the American dream, and we've got this little uh, article from Wines and some supplemental stuff to talk about, but um, that one's going to kind of let us down a little easy, even though it's the big question of the meaning of life. This topic is is one that um, is one of my favorites for the whole quarter, um, and it's also one of the ones that can be uh, the most challenging and difficult, mostly because of how abstract it is and how big picture it is and how theoretical it is. So it's, it's kind of like a a full circle here for the quarter because we started with a heavy dose of ethical theory with Kant, Mill, and Aristotle um, and then uh, we've kind of focused on more grounded stuff, still still theoretical, um, you know all the topics in business ethics have been theoretical um, but a little bit more connected with particular circumstances and scenarios and things like that. This uh, This topic is kind of a return to the big picture but still with an eye toward um, society uh, rather than just principles of justice in general. Um, definitely there's a big connection with that and uh, we'll be uh, bringing up Kant again. Kant is going to be very relevant for Rawls um, but uh, definitely still pretty abstract um, and, and, and difficult to evaluate because when the scope is this broad like all aspects of society, justice, social justice basically, um, there's a lot of different facets to that. Um, and Rawls is attempting uh, to provide a framework for dealing with all of those issues. And so um, to treat Rawls as having a similar kind of ambition like Kant, Mill, and Aristotle did, I think is appropriate. Um, and I think Rawls knows this too. Rawls knows the audacity of the project that he's attempting, uh, and that's why um, his writings are very extensive. The main book that um, this theory is taken from is uh, his book uh, Justice as Fairness and that's a pretty big monster um, so there's a lot of work to do and and we're not going to be seeing all of that work we're just going to be kind of getting a introduction to um, Rawls's theory I the the document the scans that I have for the reading assignment for Rawls are selections taken from that book and I, I like these selections okay generally I I shy away from reading selections that kind of like chop it up into little bits. Um, I definitely avoided that with Kant, Mill, and Aristotle. I think it's good to kind of get get it straight from the horse's mouth in its entirety. Um, but uh, with Rawls, it's it's big. It's really big. And being able to get at least a sense of the overall vision and the proposal and some of the justification behind it, some of the ways, like uh, the the selections that you got from from uh, Justice as Fairness. Uh, you'll even see Rawls talking, making apologies. Like he's like, I know that's a big claim. I've got some arguing to do. It's coming, but this is the general plan. This is my general argumentative strategy. So we're, we'll be able to get a hint of that. And I'm going to be trying to do some to to kind of lay the foundations here in this lecture for understanding what kind of leads Rawls in the direction of this kind of of vision. So. Um, that's what we're here for tonight. I don't think that this video is going to be quite as long as a lot of the other lecture videos. Um, we're actually on pretty good pace. Um, last couple times I taught this class, schedule got delayed quite a bit. And the fact that we're going to be able to have a session for Rawls, a session for Nozick, and a session for Cohen um, is uh, going to make this all a little bit more comfortable uh, in terms of talking through everything that we need to talk through. So. Um, I think you'll find the next three videos won't be quite as long. Cohen probably <laughs> Cohen might take the full two hours, um, but I think Rawls and Nozick are going to be a little softer in terms of how much time it's going to take. But we'll see, and we'll see. Um, Li Ling's in the chat tonight. Uh, if you've got questions uh, or comments, especially if you've got um, any kind of uh, evaluative comments, like critical comments, please bring them up because with just getting a sketch of the view, if you're like, if you've got some concerns that you're like, ah, how is he going to deal with this? Or I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, that'll maybe give me the ability to bring more of the theory on the table or, or help to clarify some stuff. So yeah, I appreciate you 
uh, doing your best. Thanks for for being here and for yeah, all on you. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe some other people will show up as we get rolling here. Um, but I appreciate that you're here. And uh, any questions you ask, um, uh, I think will definitely benefit everybody, which would be very Rawlsian. So um, think about yourself as under the original position here. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> mm hmm. Yes, you are. Yes. Okay. So um, let's get started with this. So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, just the need for the discussion of social justice at all. Um, why do this kind of big picture sort of thing? Um, Rawls, in some ways, provides uh, one of the best arguments for the motivation for this when he says that um, it's one thing to talk about what is just given a society. Once you've already got a real set of circumstances on your hands where there's already systems in place, and institutions and a culture and all this kind of stuff then um, <clears throat> becomes a lot harder to um, think big picture about what's appropriate because we already have a bunch of intuitions about what's appropriate um, and there's all this kind of momentum of society moving in a certain direction about things um, but whether that society uh, and the rules and systems and institutions that have been set up are ultimately morally justified can't come from just the facts of the society itself. We've already introduced this kind of theme before when we've talked about government, that like just because a government makes certain laws doesn't mean that they're just. But you talk about justice within the framework of the law once you've got a government with laws and all that kind of stuff too. That's That kind of uh, distinction of two different levels is exactly parallel to what's happening here at the conception of social justice. And all the difficulties of coming up with a, a vision of social justice that is actually rationally justified and doesn't have um, isn't vulnerable to bias is really re really difficult and um, you might uh, maybe some of you while you were doing the reading you were like oh I see what Tim's doing here I see why Tim set up the topics because I did set them up in a very intentional way here there's a reason why we did the international business section right before the social economic justice section. And that's because uh, the international business discussion got us got, got on the radar this concern about bias and whether we're taking for granted the sorts of values and conceptions of what is just, um, whether we're taking those for granted in a question begging sort of way and whether we're actually able to defend in a universal way those values and principles and practices and all that sort of stuff. That's the territory that we're in here. So I think the, <clears throat> the international business discussion and the complexities that show up there really um, seed the ground really well to motivate why we'd want to talk about this kind of big picture notion of, of social justice and why the disagreements there could be uh, very deep ones to try to work out. Um, but why going to that level of abstraction is justified um, and maybe necessary. So that's that's one important big idea here. This idea that um, societies, kind of like Velasquez said, right? Velasquez was worried that um, just assuming that uh, a practice is appropriate because it's a part of a culture or it's a part of a tradition um, is an arbitrary identification. There's no good reason for just preferring it because that's how people do things. Um, <clears throat> we need something a little bit more. And that's what a comprehensive theory of social justice is attempting to do. The other thing that I think is a kind of uh, important um, introduction to the topic in general and that Rawls does a good job sort of articulating as well. There's a reason why I started the unit with Rawls. Whether you agree or disagree with his proposals, um, he sort of sets up the debate, I think, in a way that calls attention to the things that define and frame the core questions themselves, regardless of what answer you give to social justice, uh, like which vision you think is appropriate. And that's this idea of how when we're talking about social justice, we're not talking about um, all moral issues that have to do with people and their behavior. We're talking really specifically about the moral responsibilities that attach to social institutions. Okay, And businesses are social institutions. 
Um, so that's why this topic is relevant for, for this class. However, um, definitely Rawls and Nozick and Cohen are going to be talking about um, issues of social justice that pertain not just to the business world, but also to government. Um, government is also a social institution and is absolutely subject to concerns about social justice um, too. But businesses are as well. Um, Rawls is going to be offering a kind of social, sort of social contract theory. And if you remember our discussion of social contract theory back from fiduciary duty, I actually used the metaphor of government as a way to illustrate what social contract was all about, but then was going to be applied into business. The thing that businesses and governments share in common <clears throat> is that they're systems of cooperation. And that's what a society is. A society is um, defined by systems of cooperation. Um, though that cooper I'm using cooperation in a pretty loose sense here because um, even within a system of cooperation, you can have oppression. That can happen. Um, and it's uh, certainly um, uh, kinds of really egregious cases of oppression are objected to as being unjust systems of cooperation. okay? So you can call them a system of cooperation even if um, they don't seem very cooperative. They still rely, they only exist in as much as everyone's playing by the rules. So even if you're a slave um, and you don't have, you're disempowered by that society um, and you're oppressed by that society, you're still a part of that system and your presence, your existence, and your behaviors are um, either a threat to that or not a threat to that. Um, when we talk about systems of cooperation, they're not necessarily stable. Um, they're always moving targets. They don't, uh, societies are not stagnant sorts of things. They're constantly evolving and changing, even if there are some things that stay the same, like traditions over a long stretch of time. Um, they are changing. And, um, but any, any system only has cohesiveness at all. We can only sort of identify a society in as much as we have people who are interacting. And that kind of interaction is all I really mean by a system of cooperation. Um, there is going to be a move to uh, cooperation in a fuller, more robust sense, um, but it's kind of, and Rawls is going to help with this, what's interesting to think about are systems of cooperation that could really legitimately bear the title of cooperation as being the ones that are going to be more just. Um, but that's, that's the ballpark of what we're talking about here, our social institutions, systems in society, not individual actors and individual behavior, except in as much as individual actors and individual behavior are a part of that system. Okay, So that's what we're focusing on. It's kind of like imagining the society as an agent. And, and I know um, the topic of corporate identity, like a business as a person, is a controversial one. Um, <clears throat> and we don't, well, we don't have to think about um, social, social institutions as people in order to see them as being subject to considerations of justice. Okay, so I'm using that just as a metaphor just now. If you think about an individual person having moral obligations or moral responsibilities for their behavior, um, we can also, like ways in which an individual lives appropriately or lives inappropriately, we can also talk about whether systems in society are uh, deserving to exist, morally speaking, or not deserving to exist morally speaking. And that's what we're talking about with social justice. Um, individuals are, there's concern for them that's going to be a part of that, but we're going to be thinking about these these bigger systems of interpersonal action. That's, that's, the, um, that's the focus. And to follow up on that just a little bit more here, um, when we're talking about questions about how to set up those systems, um, another framing device that I think is useful here theoretically is to think about um, as like the most salient um, moral variables here. Think about how once you've got people working together in a system, there are going to be unique benefits and burdens that come from that system. So for example, um, let's contrast it. Let's say you are uh, living out in the woods by yourself, like completely off the grid, not connected with society in any sort of way. 
there are um, opportunities that are available to you in those circumstances, and there are burdens that also you have to deal with in virtue of that situation. If you imagine different conditions that you are in, um, like uh, physical conditions, mental conditions, emotional conditions, all of that kind of stuff, geographical, environmental, con all the kinds of con conditions, internal and external, that's what I'm emphasizing right now, um, those will present unique advantages and disadvantages um, for you in that situation. But that's kind of all about you and the world in, it, in its physical aspects with no social dimension to it, really. This is kind of like Robinson Crusoe on an island all by himself kind of thing, right? And he's got to think up a plan for how he's going to make actions and make ends meet, survive, all that kind of stuff, deal with his circumstances. But now if we uh, make the situation more complex, if we've got um, not just you operating as an individual agent as if you're the only person who exists in the world, period, but now we start talking about people, multiple people living alongside of each other, they um, it might just be pure anarchy when there if there's like no system whatsoever. Um, that itself, I think, is a kind of system. Um, to say there are no rules is a proposal about what rules we ought to have. So it's in the conversation. Anarchy is not uh, eliminated from this conversation about social justice. There are anarchists, people who think that this would be the most just arrangement. Um, but anarchy um, really does just tr ends up putting you in the position of treating other people as like environmental circumstances like living in the forest by yourself and you have to deal with the environmental circumstances uh, of nature <laughs> right um, but as soon as we start seeing people um, aligning their behaviors with each other in certain patterned ways they may not be equal they may be unequal but they're still their behavior is sensitive to each other imagine that there's some sort of plan here that system of cooperation is going to have unique benefits and burdens okay and that's that's the big idea I've been sort of on the track for over the last few minutes talking here that a social arrangement has not just natural benefits and burdens like natural opportunities that people have and natural burdens that they have to face because of their circumstances but now the circumstances are changed in a pretty significant way we can talk about social benefits and social burdens and I, I want to kind of make this as intuitive as I possibly can in the lecture tonight, um, because sometimes it can, the abstraction can, can really mess with our ability to imagine what's going on here. And I think I have a good touchstone for you for how to wrap your head around these like social benefits and burdens, um, or just, I guess just an illustration of this. Um, if you've ever been on a club, been in a family, <laughs> <laughs> or like a church or something like that, like a religious community <clears throat> or a business, there are now, I, I like the club element because um, our attention, a club doesn't feel mandatory, right? It's something that you elect to participate with. You can get by in life without being a part of a club. But if you want to make a club happen, you like say a student club or or any kind of club, intramural sports team or something like that, you there there are costs that are um a unique part of getting everyone on the same page right even just like having someone who's um keeping track of the policies or agreements that people have made um let, let's say you've got a let's say you got an intramural sports team you're gonna play softball or something down at the rec center in your neighborhood someone's got to be sending out emails letting everyone know when the games are and making sure people show up and you've got enough players to actually play etc cetera, etc cetera. that's a cost that's a burden of making this whole thing happen uh, if you don't have someone doing that kind of work um, then things can fall apart really fast there isn't going to be the system of cooperation that's just going to happen naturally someone's going to have to make sure that that happens um, that's a kind of cost um, it also might be that, let's say you've got your group together and you want a place to meet. Um, you like, Let's say you've got a board game club and you need a place with tables to play board games. That might have some overhead to it. Um, you're going to have to find the resources necessary to make that group happen. Um, 
if you just want to play board games, you can do that in your own house. It doesn't need anything. But if you want to have a club around it, like a bigger group of people who are doing this sort of thing, now you're going to have to start organizing. And there's going to be unique costs. There's actually a board game convention um, that I go to in Issaquah every year here. Uh, it's a war gaming convention. It's mostly it's they do all sorts of board games, but war games are kind of the highlight. And it's just it's it's a very modest affair. This isn't like a big uh, there's no company or something. There's just some people who like wanted to get together once a year and play games with each other. And there are people who have to step up every year to organize it, to make sure that we have a space. Uh, we have to rent a space. You have to collect uh, sort of not really dues, but people's registration fees. There's no profit being made, but the fees are necessary to just make the opportunity happen. So th those are costs um, if you want to make this kind of cooperation thing happen. But there's also unique benefits that happen from working together, of doing something together. There's something that I can't get just playing board games by myself in my house with maybe some friends I invite over that is like this this cool convention that happens every year. <clears throat> That's a unique opportunity. Kind of pulls people together and makes things happen that otherwise I, I wouldn't be able to just make happen using my own means privately. Um, so the when we are thinking about this in an economic context, think about the difference between whether I'm running a um like pri uh, like a maybe like an etsy shop or something where i just make some things and sell them in an entrepreneurial sort of way versus if i want to start scaling up a little bit right and i want to start having other people making the same things i'm making but there's like quality control and stuff but there might be some unique advantages there if we put our heads together and our labor together um many hands makes light work kind of thing right if we work together there's going to be <clears throat> some surplus uh, um, economic ad uh, advantage that's going to come from us working together that's greater than what we could do individually. So <clears throat> when you talk about like economic efficiencies from businesses, um, it's leveraging that on a pretty high scale. Like the biggest scale would be a multinational corporation where you've got thousands of people, if not more, working together um, and being able to create uh, greater efficiency. So the when people come together and work together, there's this surplus value too. There's all the kind of like the value that you would get out of working individually, but then there's this extra value. A lot of what social justice is about is about what patterned way or what, what procedure or what sort of policy or means um, of distributing those benefits and burdens. Okay, so that's what we're talking about with social justice. We're not talking about um, how to handle the natural uh, complications, moral complications that happen from people just working, behaving individually in their lives and affecting each other individually. With social justice, we're talking about which of these systems of cooperation are doing the morally just job of distributing those benefits and burdens. Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to shoulder the costs of this cooperation? And who's going to receive the benefit? And how much of these things, right? Who's getting it and how much is, is the question. And there's advantages and there are disadvantages. Um, Rawls is, that, that framework is going to fit really naturally for what Rawls is going to do. But even for those who disagree with Rawls, the thing that they disagree about with Rawls is the way of distributing those benefits and burdens, the technique um, or the model or the systems or the rules about how this is all going to shake out. Okay, um, Even if your answer is anarchy, you are giving an answer directed to that question. You're saying the answer is no rules, no regulations, no system whatsoever, period. Um, Anarchy goes a step further than something like libertarianism, because libertarianism can sound like that too, like little government oversight, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in as much as libertarianism still believes in capitalism, capitalism is a system of cooperation. And we'll see that when we get to Nozick. Nozick is, uh, is going to be arguing for a libertarian view of social justice. Rawls is more in what we would call maybe a social liberal um, he's, I think, more progressive. I, I think the progressive label would apply uh, aptly to Rawls. 
Um, so you're going to see Nozick like really disagreeing with Rawls, but even he is um, buying in for some system, some sets of rules about how uh, all this is going to work out. So I think that's one of the best ways to frame this whole debate about what we're discussing. We're discussing how should benefits and burdens of social cooperation be distributed. Um, that's where we have choice. Um, to put it in, in very Rawlsian terms here, um, Rawls talks about the natural circumstances of people in a society. So taken individually, um, we have uh, different circumstances which give us natural advantages or disadvantages. Those natural advantages and disadvantages, you can think about like just brute power. Like you can even, I mean, one of these things will be something like physical strength. Um, you can develop this, like you can do strength training and all that kind of stuff, but you're working with the circumstances of your particular body and its physical limits, and that might not be equal from person to person. <clears throat> that would be like a natural advantage or disadvantage sort of thing. And when we're talking about social justice, we're not talking about the justice of those kinds of natural advantages or disadvantages or the distribution of natural circumstances. It's a matter of luck where you're born. <clears throat> and what circumstances you're born into, what kind of body you have, what kind of brain you have, um, um, and other things that uh, maybe are a factor of your parents, their circumstances, things like that. Um, and those are not issues of social justice. Now, if you want to talk about social justice with respect to that, then you're talking about, okay, given that we have natural advantages and disadvantages, given this natural type of inequality or just difference of our circumstances, um, that we're not all the same on a natural level, it, should that inform in any way how we distribute the benefits and burdens of social cooperation? That's how you can make it into a social justice issue. Um, and <clears throat> that is a question. That is a question to ask. I actually have a good illustration of this. Um, I feel like I maybe have talked about this before, but when I was preparing for the lecture tonight, I was like, I can't, I just can't remember. I don't know if I've talked about disability uh, and disability justice directly and explicitly in this class. Um, I'm kind of thinking I hadn't because I was at a talk about roles actually a few, like a couple months ago, and I brought up disability in the like Q&A. Um, so maybe that's why I'm thinking I talked about it, but I'm not sure I've talked about it. here. Li Ling, can you help me out? Do you remember me talking about disability justice at all in a previous lecture? I have a, I have this like weird feeling like I did, like maybe talking about stairs in buildings, like buildings designed with stairs. Okay, don't recall that. Okay, well then I'm just going to do it. <clears throat> if I'm repeating myself, well, it's a fantastic topic and a fantastic idea, so I'm I'm okay with taking that risk rather than not talking about it. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know if any of you have been exposed to um, sort of the um, sociology and the theories around social justice around uh, disabilities, um, but um, one thing that you commonly hear from people talking about this and I think is absolutely right, is that disability itself, the status of being disabled or being given that label, is really a social construction. And that's not some kind of woo-woo concept here of everyone is equal or nothing is better than anything worse and we don't want to be offensive, we got to be PC or something like that. There's something much, much, much deeper to this and much more um, legitimate than just a rhetorical uh, offering of how we're going to talk about things. Um, there's a real way in which disability, the idea of a disability is completely an artificial construction and not rooted in something in nature. It's not a natural property to be disabled. Here's the, And that might cut against your intuition. That might seem counterintuitive. It seems counterintuitive to plenty of people. I've, I've had these discussions a lot with, with people. But um, one of my uh, favorite ways to talk about this is that disability is the kind of label that we, that people in today and in the past have um, put onto people in circumstances where there's this contribution of not just the individual and what 
properties or traits they have, like the state of their physical body or the state of their psychology, but that plus an environment. Okay, so what's going on with the rest of society? Um, so take, a, take for example, um, uh, having to use a wheelchair, like uh, uh, being unable to walk. Um, that's uh, like um, that's one of the like classic cases that gets talked about with disability, right? Someone who has to use a wheelchair is disabled. They say that. Um, but imagine, um, in, in many ways, this is just a contrast that we pick out because of what's going on more generally in society. If you imagined, um, a, a, imagine the human race was 99% organisms that are unable to do this upright walking thing. They just can't do it. Okay. Um, and let's leave off the stuff about evolutionary success. I mean, we can definitely construct a circumstance in which um, a, a species could have uh, won the, um, the evolutionary lottery without having that ability and developing to the point of sentience, like we have the ability to reason, all that kind of stuff. In those circumstances, um, you wouldn't see buildings built with stairs you'd see buildings built in a very, very different way. And the people who are um, in the position of being able to walk on their hind legs to do this ambulatory activity would be the, the sort of fringe cases. They would be the minority. And you wouldn't have all of society catering to that minority, to setting up circumstances um, in which um, that's going on. So when we talk about things like accessibility, Accessibility is a matter of what is happening with an individual plus what's happening in their broader environment. Um, I have access to all of the rooms of a building if, um, if I'm in a wheelchair, if stairs are not the only way of getting to the other floors. If there's other ways to do it, then it's accessible to me. And issues of justice here are a matter of a basic moral um, right, a supposed moral right, and we'll talk about Rawls kind of giving a similar sort of argument for this, um, of why um, equal opportunity of access is something that society should be providing. So society can't um, make people walk that aren't able to walk. We don't have the means to do that except in certain cases. Um, but it, you know, across the board, we couldn't do something like that. But what we can do is think about the system of cooperation for achieving certain tasks that are uh, done in ways that are accessible to people of different circumstances. Okay, so that is something that we can talk about. Uh, one I always get from my students is, uh, especially in teaching philosophy classes, that people say, I'm a visual learner, right? So I, I want to see things like drawn and diagrams and stuff like that to be able to process that information. Um, to find another avenue by which to present the same information um, or another technique by which to solve the same task is what accessibility is all about. And that can be a social justice issue because it's a matter of what's going on with the systems of cooperation. If all of the best jobs were in buildings that only had stairs and no elevators and no ramps, no, no, they weren't accessible, then that would be an issue of justice because there'd be no way to hold down a job um, if you were unable to use stairs. Okay, So when we talk about disability as a social construction, it's talking about how your inability to do something is not purely a matter of the individual circumstances that you're in, but also the environment, the circumstances of the environment, and then how that fits to where you're at or doesn't fit to where you're at. Um, so that would be um, something we could talk about as an individual level, but to only talk about it on the individual level is um, not taking the full story of justice into account. There's something happening on this social level too, and in as much as there's a connection there, we can talk about it in terms of social justice, how we're going to be responsive to people's individual circumstances. And that's very much something that's in the background here for Rawls, too. Um, Liling, did that example work for you? You're my, you're my test case. And just how we're doing so far in the lecture. Have any questions been popping up as I've been sort of setting the stage here? So far, so good? Cool. I'm curious if the, this sounds uh, um, familiar or whether it sounds uh, like something new to you.
familiar? You've heard about this kind of stuff before? Mm. I mean, the, especially the stuff about uh, disability and social justice pops up a lot in sociology contexts because sociology is about understanding what's going on with the systems in society. And uh, when you start looking at that, you're like, oh, um, a lot of the ideas that we throw around are not as simple. Um, uh, they're, they're not as... They're not things that can be taken as much on face value because they only get their meaning because of the broader context of what's happening in the rest of society. Um, certainly, this stuff is firmly on the radar for anyone working on ethics and moral philosophy, too. Um, because to talk about individual justice without talking about social justice is only getting like half the picture. And going all the way back to Plato, um, the idea that there's a pattern here, that principles of justice in the biggest picture sense, need to apply on the individual and the collective level um, that they uh, are realized at both levels has been around forever, as long as people have been thinking about moral philosophy and justice. Um, but let's let's start getting into Rawls here. And again, Liling, please interrupt. Please jump in at any time you want. I'll probably try to uh, ask you uh, at various points in the lecture, but I can kind of just get rolling here. So I'd like you to jump in whenever you want. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, all right, so society needs to be think, thought of in terms of a system of cooperation um, that ostensibly is designed to advance the good of those who are taking part in it. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone's going to benefit, um, but that there is some benefit. There's some reason why we'd want a system of cooperation, even if that system is something like slavery. There's a motivation for someone, like slave, slavery is giving an advantage to someone, otherwise no one would do it, okay? Um, but even beyond that, without those like absurd examples of proposals for how to structure society, um, like slavery cannot be justified. Um, I mean, if you think you can justify slavery, I'd love to hear the argument because I, uh, I haven't heard anything that gives me any inkling that there's any way to justify that. Um, but even with some of those more extreme suggestions off the table, we can, like we imagine people who are thinking, yeah, the purpose of society is not to benefit some people at the expense of everybody else. Um, we can still have disagreements about what a just arrangement in society is supposed to look like. So what we need are principles of social justice to determine a social arrangement um, that divides up these benefits and burdens of cooperation in an appropriate way. Okay, so that's that's really what we're disagreeing about. And there's two really classic um, proposals that have been on the table in this debate. The, the sort of, I guess you could say there's like this classical uh, debate and disagreement between two positions. Rawls is gonna challenge that traditional setup a little bit but also in the disagreement between especially Rawls and Nozick, you can see some of the familiar aspects of this traditional disagreement showing up. And then Cohen is also going to talk explicitly about this traditional disagreement as well. But the basic conflict is um, social justice, uh, like what are the moral values that are supposed to direct this, concept, this system of social justice that's uh, advising how we should be dividing up the benefits and burdens of society? On the one hand, you have this kind of libertarian position that lifts up as the like chief moral value here, the central moral value, the prioritized moral value, liberty and freedom. So letting people do what they want, um, giving them freedom of choice um, as much as possible. That's one value that, and and this kind of the at the extreme end, you get this kind of libertarianism. Um, where everything about the structure of society is trying to maximize people's freedom and liberty. That's the main f focus there. On the other hand, you've got this position that we might call liberalism, um, which is focused around well-being. That social justice is primarily, in, instead of liberty as the core value, the core value here is people's well-being, their livelihood, their um, welfare. 
I mean, the, the whole idea of welfare programs is coming from the broader theoretical value of welfare itself. Doing well, standard of living, this kind of thing. Um, so the liberty stuff uh, skews more toward the direction of um, principles of, of obligation um, and rights, like what you cannot do to interfere with other people. Um, basically, the a principle of non-interference is a good way to sum up that kind of vision um, that's putting liberty at the top. Um, and the kind of liberalism that's putting people's well-being drifts more into utilitarian directions because we're thinking about maximizing good consequences, right? In increasing people's standard of living, um, the resources that they have, the opportunities that they have, those kinds of goods, um, rather than about this value of freedom. Now, these two positions don't think that the value of the other one is completely morally irrelevant. What defines these two positions is basically which one do they prioritize over the other. If you remember, way back at the beginning of the quarter, I had those first week discussion questions, and I posed this question to you. Um, and maybe now at this point in the quarter, you've got more to say in terms of giving a response to that. Um, but the basic idea here is if push comes to shove, which of these values are you willing to sacrifice for the other? Of course we'd like both. And Rawls is actually going to value both too. But when push comes to shove, um, which one is going to get sacrificed for the sake of the other? So are we going to reduce people's freedom by, say, taxing them? in order to fund social welfare programs that are going to improve the quality of life for people overall and maximize good consequences? Or are we going to maximize liberty in a way that maybe doesn't directly harm people, but sets up a system, sets up a set of circumstances in which some people fall through the cracks, um, some people are not in great living conditions? Um, which one are you more comfortable with? I, a lot of people, when I did the first week discussion thing, tried to like escape the question I was posing by saying like both are valuable, don't know how to choose one or the other. But those are real dilemmas. Those are real um, circumstances that we that we have to face. Rawls is going to try to create a system of dealing with both of those answers in a novel way, because uh, he's got he's skeptical of both answers. Actually, he thinks. Um, both of them are guilty of bias, and we'll come to that. Um, so he's trying to find another way to ground all of this. But that's the, kind of the traditional debate here of, of what is a more important um, moral value for guiding the structure of society. Okay. Um, and it kind of comes back to some of the big principled theoretical disagreements that we talked about with the theories at the beginning of the quarter. So I like that kind of full circle thing too. Okay, so that uh, we're trying to figure out these principles of social justice. Rawls is going to propose this idealized social contract, which he's going to call justice as fairness. And what he's not doing is setting up, and he's, he's, he's careful about clarifying this, he's not setting up fairness as the central moral value. Instead, what he's saying is the central moral values are going to be determined, like the core principles of social justice are going to be determined by those agreements that we would make, the hypothetical contracts we would agree to if we were kind of negotiating from a fair position. Okay, so think about the difference here between process and product. Um, what is the answer we're going to arrive at? And what's the way in which we're going to get to that answer? And Rawls is putting a lot more focus on how we get to the answer than the answer itself. The answer is going to come out eventually, but he thinks that as uh, in terms of a philosophical analysis of the issue of social justice, our eye needs to be keenly on how we're going to arrive at that answer. And he thinks the way of thinking about that answer has to start from a position of fairness. If you've got a position of inequality or um, unequal negotiating positions, then we're looking at a, a sort of situation of might makes right. And that's not correct. Um, justice is not determined by power. Justice is not determined by what happens. Like how I started this lecture. Just because a government makes a law doesn't mean it's a just law. Just because society operates in a certain way doesn't mean that that's appropriate. Just because a, um, the business world sort of evolves into a certain pattern of behavior doesn't mean it's just just because that's what's happening or that's, that's what the market determined or something like that. As We've talked about this quite a lot this quarter, so that should be a familiar idea. 
Um, but instead, so he's going to think about justice. The principles of justice will be the, the true ones, the ones that are actually justified here, are the ones that would be determined um, in a way, uh, it would be the principles that free and rational people concerned to further their own interests, that's an important addition here by Rawls, what they would agree to from an initial position of equality, what he's going to call the original position, as defining the fundamental terms of their association. Again, how they're working in cooperation with each other, um, or collaboration might be a really good word here. So um, the, the first idea here is that those are principles that are going to be regulatory principles um, to actual contracts. So if you remember before, we talked about a quasi-contract. And quasi-contracts are not real contracts. A, a social contract theory is not saying this was something that actually happened. You did not uh, sit down and negotiate with the United States government when you agreed to be a citizen and follow the laws. And the government was like, okay, uh, yes, we're going to uh, accept this authority and power to give laws as long and we're going to see our legitimacy as premised on whether we are advancing justice uh, and principles of freedom and working toward the well-being of citizens and you included. Um, that never happened, but it might make sense to think about your relationship with the government as if you made a contract like that. And that's what a social contract theory for government, uh, for the legitimacy of government is talking about. Um, same thing here that um, the actual agreements that we make are not social contracts, okay? But, and they can't define, uh, they can't define the principles of social justice either. You can't um, create, uh, or you can't treat social justice as another commodity to be bought and traded on the market relative to people's power positions. That's not the right way to think about the social, uh, just issues of justice, period. So what Rawls is saying instead is that once we have these principles of social justice, um, they, are, they are themselves not contracts, but we are supposed to live, if we're a just society, we're supposed to live as if we were under such a contract. So when we're making actual contracts, we're thinking about whether those contracts violate the principles of social justice, these the social contract principles, okay? So... Uh, going back to the government analogy, if um, people in government are thinking about their authority and their responsibility in terms of the social contract, they're going to be making policy proposals and arguing for them in the House of Representatives or the Senate or the president might be doing this or the arguments that justices in the court system make when they deliver a ruling. They might think about those particular policies or laws that they want to enact as subject to the set of laws or rules that are a part of this theoretical social contract. That's how it's supposed to work. So it's not as though um, principles of social justice decide directly what sort of actual agreements and transactions we take place in. Rather, all the actual agreements and transactions that we take that take place need to happen in the shadow of the social contract. That's what's going on here. Um, the other thing I want to talk about really early on here about the original position, where I'm going to dive in this in detail, but um, this is all theoretical, right? As the quasi-contract is this as-if sort of thing, it doesn't require that we actually are able to circumstantially create this sort of original position. The fact remains that we are not in a position of equality. There's no way that we can do that. But we can maybe hypothesize about such a thing through a theoretical thought experiment. And that's what Rawls is going to do. Okay, so let's talk about um, uh, let's talk about that in detail. Checking in with you, Li Ling, how are things going? Any questions? No, cool. All right. Um, Am I, uh, just to check in, do, am I kind of uh, being too redundant or taking things too slow? I'm trying to be careful since I know I've got time, um, but uh, am I going too slow? Does this feel like the right pace? Disconnected. Are, you're disconnected from the chat? Oh, 
Oh, you you uh, lost a couple minutes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Bummer. Um, but when you when you were able to hear what's going on, it's been going at a good pace. Oh, you didn't hear my question. Ah, I was wondering whether my lecture was going too slow, uh, whether I was being too redundant in talking things over. No, okay, okay, okay. I'm trying to be careful here because it's so abstract. Um, wonderful. Um, definitely, I, I remember, and I, I mean, it still happens to me uh, now, even after all these years of studying philosophy, um, when you get to really abstract stuff, the first time you hear it, it's just like, what? Like, doesn't quite click and sink in. And sometimes just hearing it a few times can help. So um, there are going to be some familiar themes I'm going to talk about probably over and over in this lecture, but uh, that redundancy is, uh, will hopefully be a benefit. It's not quite clicking yet. Okay, okay. Maybe this next part's going to help a little bit because we're going to dive in the detail here of of what Rawls has in mind. In fact, you know, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go forward a little bit here. Just need to pause. Yeah. I think I think I'm gonna actually do things in a little different order because I think that might be a little helpful um, for this situation, and then and then maybe we can take a break too, and you kind of let it sink in a little bit. Um, but let's get over this next big idea. Um, so let's actually go back to when I was talking about this traditional disagreement between social liberals, progressives that are concerned about well-being um, as like the main concern of social justice, and then this kind of libertarian thing that's focused on. Uh, liberty and freedom. Um, Rawls is thinking, like I said, he, he's worried that these two theories are biased. Um, that basically, he, he's kind of a cynic, <laughs> to be to be fair. He, he kind of has this cynical view about humanity, that basically people prefer a conception of social justice that caters to their personal circumstances. So he uses this example that um, uh, people who are rich or who have advantages currently um, in society are not fans of uh, welfare systems, and instead they would prefer a model of social justice which gives them maximum liberty, basically to do the most that they can with what they have. Um, and they don't want uh, redistribution, they don't want uh, having some of their power taken away or restricted, um, for the sake of other people to have a better life, right? Um, because they have, and they're the ones who would be taken from under such a system. But if you are poor or disempowered or don't have as many opportunities, if you're lower on the pecking order of the social totem pole, um, then you are going to be a fan of conceptions of social justice, which are going to present you with advantages. Um, and so Rawls is kind of like, I'm worried about bias on both levels. Um, I would I want to find a way to argue for a conception of social justice that isn't subject to that kind of bias. It's very similar to this debate that we're having in international business. Can we have an argument for a universal um, set of moral principles um, that can regulate cross-cultural moral disagreement um, that isn't just prioritizing or privileging people that come from a certain culture? Like we don't like Velasquez didn't want to have um, rules for international ethics that are really just privileging the values of Westerners. That's a concern, right? If there's if there's going to be a system of appropriate universal moral laws or moral principles or moral values, those things um, can't be subject to bias. They are going to have to get justification that comes from someplace else. So that's what sort of motivates Rawls to think about this idea of the original position. He's basically looking for some kind of escape route out of that dilemma. Uh, the dilemma where it's just like, well, it looks like everything's biased. 
So like, what are we, what can we do about that? And, and like I said a few minutes ago, this original position is going to be a theoretical thought experiment. It's not something that we are actually capable of really attaining. May, I've actually thought, you know, in a kind of science fiction-y sort of way that maybe science and technology would enable us to actually create this original position many, many years from now. Um, but definitely it's outside of our grasp at the moment. But that doesn't mean it can't provide some kind of moral clarity or moral guidance for our thinking around social justice and how to adjudicate these disagreements about what uh, vision of social justice is really appropriate. Um, so so that's, that's um, understanding that theoretical problem is great for framing what is going to be Rawls theoretical proposal. This whole goofy thing I'm about to talk about with the original position is really motivated by Rawls trying to dodge the concern about bias. Um, so that that's the big idea here. Um, and, and just, I guess, while we're at it, before we take the break, let's talk about the original position itself. So I, I've kind of talked about this in sketch before, um, but I, I'll, I'll give you the kind of my goofy um, illustrative example of it, and then we'll talk about it in more of its details. Um, so, or the more technical language that Rawls uses. So imagine that all of, all of us are sucked out of our bodies and our souls are sent to the moon. If you don't believe in souls, just play along for fun here. Um, but our, our consciousness or something is sort of uh, taken to the moon um, and put into like, I don't know, robot bodies or something like that. So we can talk to each other. Uh, we can gesticulate and do all this kind of stuff. Um, however, by getting this kind of detachment out of our bodies, this out-of-body experience, um, in the process, we fall under the veil of ignorance. In other words, in this position while we're at the moon, um, this original position, we don't know um, what our circumstances are. We don't know which person down there on the planet is us. We don't know what our bodies are like. We don't know what our minds are like. We don't know, Rawls goes as far to say, we don't know, um, if you're following away in the lecture notes here, I've got a whole list of this stuff. You don't know your role, your class, your status in society. You don't know what kind of pro personal property you own. You don't know what your natural abilities are. And you don't even know, he goes as far as to say this stuff. You don't know what your perspective or opinion is on what is the good life. Like, you don't know what religion you subscribe to. You don't know what sense of happiness you have. You don't know, um, like if you're thinking back to Aristotle, just trying to figure out like what's an excellent life for humanity. You don't know what theory you've got on that. You don't know what values you're prioritizing in your conception of the excellent life. You also don't even know your psychological propensities. So all that stuff is abstracted away. Um, but you're still an agent. You still have a mind. You can entertain proposals, think about them logically. Uh, engage in rational deliberation, all this kind of stuff. It's just all the contingencies of your life um, are sort of quarantined. They're held in escrow, <laughs> to use a business term here. Um, they're suspended, and you can't touch them. They're, fr they're frozen, and you can't use them to inform your reasoning. Okay, so that's, that's the original position under the veil of ignorance as Rawls is conceiving of it. And Rawls is thinking... Whatever rules we would agree to for how to organize uh, these sort of like master principles of social cooperation, whatever we'd agree to under that position would be the one that would be truly just. So this would be a kind of objective way of giving a rational justification for a particular conception of social justice. Basically, social justice would be defined by those rules that we'd agree to under those circumstances. And that's what he means by fairness, right? Um, without having knowledge of our circumstances, we're not in a position to sort of see on what side our bread is buttered kind of thing. Uh, we can't um, argue objectively for this vision of social justice with secretly knowing that it's going to work to our interests personally. We don't have access to that. Um, why? Because we're just it's not information available to us. That's Rawls's way out of this. Um, and it's really, I mean, this is a noteworthy part of his proposal. He doesn't try to eliminate selfishness. 
he actually assumes that people are going to be self-interested in this bargaining that happens on the moon. The moon is my invention. That's not Rawls. But I, I think it's a good illustration. But when we're at this big round table on the moon and deciding how we're going to set up society, um, Rawls is thinking we're going to be self-interested. We're going to be looking to our own advantage. It's just we don't know circumstantially or contingently what is our advantage. Um, we can only think about it in this abstract universal way. Um, I brought up Rawls before as a way uh, to try to illustrate what's happening with Kant and the categorical imperative, this idea about universalizing a rule without contradiction. I don't know if you remember the story where I was talking about, or where Kant's talking about walking down the street, past a homeless person, you're like, I'm not going to hurt him, but do I have to help him? And then I have to imagine, like, would I be cool with a rule that says you don't have to help people when you're in a position to help and they're in need? You don't have to help them. Can I universalize that maxim? And I can't because under some circumstances, I would will for the person to help me. And in other circumstances, I would will for them to not help me. So that's going to be contradictory either way. Um, so we got to come up with something else as a, as a universal principle. This original position by Rawls is not exactly the same as what Kant has in mind. There are some people who think it's exactly the same. I actually don't think it's exactly the same. Um, but it's pretty gosh darn close. Because if I'm having to think about whether I can universalize a maxim under all possible circumstances, can I will this maxim under all universal circumstances I could face? That's pretty similar as the type of thinking I have to do when I'm in this veil of ignorance. If I don't know who I am, I'm going to have to take seriously all the possibilities. I could be this person. I could be this person. I could be this person. And what would I want under all those possible circumstances? And can we set up a set of rules that I'm going to be cool with given all those possibilities? All right. Um, I'm going to talk about that idea as a kind of universal buy-in. Um, and maybe I'll talk about that when we get back from the break here. But ju just to kind of go more in Rawls's language here, Rawls says that from this original position as the basis for social justice, we're going to design decide on all the ground rules. That's a good metaphor here. Prior to the negotiations that happen once we're living our actual lives and we know who we are and we have per desires and we have value commitments and we have religious affiliations and we have all the rest of this stuff that's contingent from person to person. Um, the basic rules of engagement for how we're going to have any of the rest of the negotiations is what we're negotiating under the original position. Basically, what are going to be the rules of the systems of society? What you do within those rules is a separate matter. But how are we going to set it up? What are going to be the conditions that allow for what's possible and what's not possible? Okay, That's, that's what's going to happen here. Um, it can be pretty specific. For example, I think it can be a part of the original position to say no slavery. That is a part of the original position. Whether AT&T should do a merger with some other company, that's not a part of the original position. Okay, But these sorts of things like this is off limit for the market. You cannot buy and sell human beings. That would be a ground rule for what, what kinds of transactions are possible or what other sorts of negotiations are going to be possible or how they'd have to be done to be legitimate that w those are the sorts of rules we're going to be talking about under the original position and that have to do with social justice okay so when Rawls is saying justice as fairness he's saying if you don't know who you are in society that's a fair situation to start negotiating about what rules we should set up for these systems of society Okay, so here's the quote from him. Uh, the intuitive idea of his proposal is that since everyone's well-being depends upon a scheme of cooperation, society, without which no one could have a satisfactory life, um, the division of advantages should be such, again, distributing the benefits of social cooperation, should be such as to draw forth the willing cooperation of everyone taking part in it including those less well situated. Yet this can be expected only if reasonable terms are proposed. So this is what I have in mind with this kind of um, uh, universal buy-in idea, that a just society is one that has a system that everyone could sign up for, regardless of their circumstances. They'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm down with that. And that is something we're naturally going to have an eye to, 
uh, will start reflecting on that if I don't know my contingent circumstances. Why? Because if I know my contingent circumstances, it's very tempting for me to be like, I don't have to worry about those other possibilities. I just have to deal with the ones that I have to face. I don't have to think about starving kids in Africa. I don't need to think about um, people who uh, have different physical circumstances than mine. Um, I don't have to think about all those other sorts of issues that people have to face that I don't have to face. I have my own problems. I have my own things. I just have to deal with what I've got going on. And that kind of myopia, that kind of solipsism is what the original position is supposed to blow up. That basically, if you still want to think about selfishness, go for that. Like Rawls is like, I'm not going to try to re rewire your brain to be a Buddhist who's enlightened and has no sense of self. All I need to do is pull away all the information about your contingent circumstances and we'll get the same result. And I think that's a really interesting idea. It's also one that he's been challenged on, um, but that's, that's his logic. That's his proposal. Okay, so I think this is a good natural uh, break taking place. So I think I'm going to do that, uh, catch my breath a little bit. Um, and Li Ling, you can think about if you've got, uh, kind of let this stuff sink in a little bit and see if any questions bubble to the surface. All right, see you all on YouTube in just like a second. All right, so getting back into it. Let, let's just go back to that quote I was just reading uh, a second ago. And though if you're watching this on YouTube, you probably just, just heard it. But let's, let's just uh, tap back into it. Um, so Rawls is saying of his general approach here that the intuitive idea is that since everyone's well-being depends on a scheme of cooperation without which no one could have a satisfactory life, this is saying like everyone in society has something to stand. They, they've got skin in the game on this system of social cooperation, however it is set up. Um, the division of advantages should be such as to draw forth the willing cooperation of everyone taking part in it, including those less well situated. Yet this can be expected only if reasonable terms are proposed. Um, in some ways, I've had some students react in the past that uh, take issue with this about whether um, there's like uh, whether society is a necessary scheme of cooperation in order to have a satisfactory life. Like, what? Why would I? Maybe I I would opt to not participate in society. Um, and certainly, maybe there are still people who can like live off in the woods and do that kind of thing. But increasingly this isn't really a choice anymore. It's not like you get to decide whether you want to participate or not. I mean, even if you try to live off the grid, you have to wrestle with everyone who's on the grid. The grid itself is something that you are now having to really take specific means to avoid if you don't want to participate. So the, the opportunity, like, like society at this point is no longer really an option. Um, and we all have skin in the game about how it happens. Um, but in this original position, it's like we're trying to like detach from that and be like, what if we could rethink all of it? What if we could rethink everything? And in that way, like social contract theories, Rawls's proposal is a proposal about what's morally ideal. And that, that moral ideal is going to then set the context for all the particular judgments we're going to make or particular policies and things like that, how we're going to handle the actual circumstances that we're faced with. Um, so this part, the other really key part of this is about draw, drawing forth the will and cooperation. So if we're imagining it, like this isn't what's really going on, but if we imagine what if we were in a position where we could decide to opt in or opt out, depending on what the proposal is like, um, that I can decide to participate or not decide to participate, um, the only way in which I can find a path by which I can agree to participate is if reasonable terms are proposed that elicit my buy-in. Okay, So I, I mentioned earlier that I think the, uh, one of the best metaphors here for Rawls um, in terms of what he's doing with the original position is trying to come up with the kinds of rules under the original position are ones that are going to have to elicit the buy-in of everyone in society. Now, that's sort of theoretically happening in the thought experiment by me being detached from all the knowledge of my particular circumstances, so I'm forced to consider it. But in as much as this can be useful to us, even if we can't construct the original position in actuality, like 
we we don't have the technology to like quarantine all of my knowledge about myself as a particular person um, in order to just reason about this purely. I can still think in terms of Rawls's original position if I'm thinking about all the different people and their circumstances and sort of the possible circumstances that people could have in a society and whether they would have buy-in to what is going on. And that buy-in we need to think about very carefully. And this is something Cohen is going to talk quite a bit about. Um, but a lot of times people will consent to things in the way our society is right now, not because the system is really proposing reasonable terms to them, but because given the system, they are coerced to participate. And that's, a, that's like what I was alluding to a second ago when I was saying, you don't really have a choice anymore. You have to participate in society. And a lot of our choices are not really choices we make from a position of idealism, but a one of like, how can I make the best life I can given this framework? When we're thinking about social justice, it's open for us to rethink everything. Everything's on the table to be discussed. And if we're thinking um, on that biggest picture level about how things ideally should be, Rawls is saying the best way to approach that question is by thinking about those proposals based on what everyone could uh, agree to and have buy-in on. Not that they're that we have to coerce or force them into participating, like in the case of slavery. Um, that needs power to work um, and oppression. Rather, what would elicit my free choice to participate? That I'm like, yeah, there's a place for me in this. And it isn't a matter of like um, the sort of political process of pork barreling, where like, I don't know if you've heard that term before, where there's all these little ad hoc things like you get this thing that you want, you get this thing that you want, and then we get an agreement here. Um, this is on a deeper sort of level. I've got a good little illustration and analogy for this um, universal buy-in thing. Um, imagine, uh, imagine that you are looking for a place to live. You need an apartment. You know, you're too poor to buy a house or something like that. So you're going to rent an apartment. Um, but you want to be living in a halfway decent place. We could talk about it under more extreme circumstances of poverty. I could do the same illustration. But uh, let's say you're just, just looking to have a decent place. And you're like, you know what? If I had some roommates and we were all pooling our money, then we could find a decent place to live. Like there, I, w I would be able to live in a, in a better, <laughs> better situation if we were able to have this kind of cooperation, this system of cooperation where we – uh, all contribute to the rent, right? Now, imagine that that, that makes sense, right? Uh, I've lived with roommates many times. Uh, maybe you have too. But imagine that setup where the place that you end up getting is a really nice place. But uh, And let's just keep it simple. Let's say you have one roommate. Um, the apartment has one bedroom. And uh, you make the proposal to your friend. You're like, hey, look, if 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 we pooled our money... I wouldn't have to live in this shithole apartment. I could live in this like really cool apartment. Um, and the friend is like, cool. Uh, so who gets the bedroom? And you're like, well, me, of course, because that's how I would be in a better situation. And they're like, what about me? And I'd be like, well, you can sleep on the floor or there's a closet. You can have the closet or something like that. Is your friend going to agree to that system of cooperation? No, they're not going to do it. They're like, I, I don't see what's in this for me. I don't see why I am attracted to agreeing to this, right? I, my situation is not really being taken into account in designing this system of cooperation that you've proposed, right? It does not elicit my buy-in, right? Um, so there would have to be some more equitable solution, a more reasonable set of terms to propose uh, if you're actually going to make an agreement happen. That little microcosm sort of illustration, imagine that on the macro level for all of society and you get pretty close to what Rawls is going for here. Uh, is that ex illustration working for you, Liling? Cool. Awesome. Any anything else pop up? Okay. Okay. I will. So um, definitely, Rawls has sort of built into this a kind of around the circle sort of way of having an egalitarian type of proposal about social justice. This kind of universal buy-in means everyone's got to be considered. 
There can't be some just people who are getting thrown under the bus for the sake of everyone else living a good life. That wouldn't be uh, – there's no, there's no system of principles of social justice that involve that kind of consequence that people could agree to under the original position. They just wouldn't be able to. Um, but sometimes you hear this like anti-egalitarian argument saying like, but people are just different. You can't make them equal. You can't have a society in which everyone's in exactly the same circumstances. And Rawls is like, yep, you're right. But, and there's a big, big but on two different levels here. One, um, Rawls is definitely going to subscribe to a system here. He, he thinks we're going, we are going to, under the original position, buy into a system that has inequalities in it, but for very important and particular reasons that we'll be getting to. And, but more present here at this moment in the lecture, um, Rawls is saying, yeah, people are always going to be different, but that shouldn't, that, those kinds of natural differences shouldn't be seen as moral differences. In other words, people's natural inequalities doesn't mean that they somehow deserve it. That wouldn't make any sense at all. You don't deserve where you're born and winning the lottery of birth or something like that. That doesn't have that doesn't mean that you have more of a moral right to happiness or more of a moral right to increased opportunities under a system of cooperation that relies on other people contributing in order to make it work. Right? You're not entitled to that. We'll get back to that idea at the very end of this lecture, but that's like a really, really key idea for Rawls. And I think he has a compelling case to make for that. That's what he has in mind when he says this. Um, even if inequality is a reality, we're not all born equal, those inequalities shouldn't translate into moral inequalities. In other words, differences in the burdens and benefits of justice. So justice shouldn't be tailored to the people who have natural advantages and against the people who have natural disadvantages. Like I was saying earlier, that really is what you're getting when you're getting a might makes right kind of perspective, right? which is basically moral suicide. I mean, that's basically a moral theory saying there is no such thing as morality, if you think might makes right. Okay, so now let's talk about, the, that's all the sort of setup here of how Rawls is setting up the arguments on behalf of these different positions. What are the principles? What are the, what, it, what is, what is the actual vision of social justice that Rawls thinks we're going to agree to under this original position? Well, First thing to keep in mind here is that Rawls thinks when we're under the veil of ignorance, what it's rational, we still have self-interest, right? So we still have this conception of rational self-interest. And just looking out for myself, I have to anticipate all the possible circumstances I could end up being in. I could be rich. I could be poor. I could be, uh, I'm a Christian and Buddhist. I could be a Muslim. I could be an atheist. I could be all sorts of different things, right? I could uh, value art. I could not really care about art at all. I could uh, want to have children. I could not want to have children. These are all different things. I could be a man. I could be a woman. I could be all sorts of things in between. There's all sorts of things that I have to be like looking out for if I'm going to think about whether I'm going to agree or disagree with the proposal that's made under the original position. So you get this situation of kind of like hedging your bets. Okay, That's, that's part of Rawls' thinking here of what we're going to agree to. The first thing he entertains though is a negative thing. He talks about well, what, what would we go for utilitarianism? And he thinks no. He don't thinks we're going to agree to utility as the guiding value for all of social justice. And for an interesting reason. He thinks, um, one, uh, well, we're going to be looking at our own interests still. And utilitarianism requires me to basically be enlightened. Like we talked about utilitarianism before. I have to be approaching all of my life decisions in terms of just maximizing good. And it's very likely that those that means that I might be in a situation in which I basically s sacrifice my own happiness for the greater good. So I will I will voluntarily put myself in that um, as one of, count myself as one of those people who like slips through the cracks of the system for the sake of everybody else. And that's exactly what Rawls thinks we're not going to agree to. It's kind of similar how we wouldn't agree with slavery under the original position, because we might be one of the slaves, that we don't think that it would be appropriate for some people in society to be thrown under the bus for everyone else. That won't elicit that kind of universal buy-in, okay? So um, so utilitarianism, he thinks, no, that's not going to be it. Just maximizing welfare overall is not going to be what's going to guide us. 
Um, but welfare will get into this, just not in the pattern that utilitarianism is proposing, not the idea of maximizing utility overall, because that might require the sacrificing of some for the sake of others. Now, you know under utilitarianism, because we studied it in depth, that it's not saying that there are some people who don't morally matter. Everyone is equally deserving of happiness under utilitarianism. But in the practical application of it, some people, what might maximize utility would be some people getting thrown under the bus. Not because the theory is setting it up, but because the circumstances set it up. And Rawls thinks that that is not something we would agree to under the original position. What he does think we're going to agree to come down to two big principles. The first one is kind of this justice liberty principle. And the second one is called the difference principle, although it's also commonly known as the Maxi Min principle. And I like Maxi Min as the name because it's a little more suggestive of what it means. The first principle is maybe controversial if we're approaching this from a Velasquez kind of point of view about worries about cultural, uh, cultural bias and relativism and stuff like that. But the first principle is saying, basically, each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberty compatible with a similar liberty for others. Um, a lot of the basic things that are in like the U.S. Bill of Rights uh, are sort of in this territory. So political liberty, a right to vote, a right to run for office, um, to be a part of governance, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, um, liberty of conscience and freedom of thought. That's a quote from Rawls, uh, which is interesting. Uh, a right to hold personal property and freedom from arbitrary arrest and seizure. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the, in the literature about whether these are really universal values that we would agree to under the original position, because maybe um, we might recognize that if we were in certain circumstances, remember, we don't, we don't get to know what our view of ethics is, we don't get to know what our view of happiness is or meaning of life. So it might be that we couldn't agree to some of these liberties, on the grounds that um, we we wouldn't want them um, if we were in those circumstances. There, there's a lot to get into about that debate and whether that objection holds any argumentative water or not. Um, I do think that um, Rawls is, eh, what I think about this, I don't know if it matters what I think about it, but I, I at least think that Rawls has a plausible case to be made for these kinds of basic liberties that no matter what your kind of cultural values are, religious values, or things like that, the, um, the freedom to be able to pursue those values is something that you'd want. But you'd also recognize that you wouldn't want to give certain people uh, really extensive liberties if it meant that it was going to violate the liberty of other people because you're like, maybe I'm that person too, right? you got to think about everybody. And that's where I think he's on his strongest footing, is, is this sort of under the original position, I, I can't be setting up how liberties are being thrown around by the society in a way that would start taking away the buy-in from certain other people. So there's this kind of negative definition here for liberty of like, well, we're going we're gonna to restrict it to these liberties or, or even propose these liberties because if we don't do that, then we don't get the buy-in from some other people, um, people in these other circumstances. So that's the kind of um, balancing that we're doing there. In detail, that is not an easy balancing act to make. Um, think about the recent, um, just today actually, the uh, Supreme Court ruled on this uh, famous case about um, a uh, religious uh, um, cake company, wedding cake company, that refused to um, make a cake for a gay wedding. And there was a question here about, there. some of the courts ruled on this, and um, the Supreme Court just overturned it. But if you read the if you read the Supreme Court resolution here, um, their like comments on the ruling, they are not really making a blatant claim here about which of these liberties um, override which others. Because something like um, the freedom to be able to be a same-sex couple in America, that's a kind of liberty, like liberty around. Um, sexual orientation is a kind of liberty that we might want to protect, but we also want to protect people's liberty with respect to religion and freedom of speech. So, you know, sometimes these things get in conflict with each other, and it's not easy to sort them out, even from the original position. Um, but we can get um, 
And I, I think Rawls is not useless here just because he doesn't solve all of those problems. What he does is he gives us a pretty clear benchmark about how we're going to go about trying to resolve uh, these situations which, when, in which certain liberties start interfering with each other. Um, that's, and, and, and so, yeah, uh, that's, that's all I'm going to say about that. The, the principle that really gets the most attention from Rawls is this maxi-min principle, this difference principle. Um, because, uh, well, it's just kind of the one that's the most controversial. Um, everyone sort of recognizes, uh, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but um, that would not be correct. But the, the stuff about the, uh, liberty and trying to give people the most freedom that we can without interfering with other people's liberty is definitely um, a very common um, moral value and making some sort of space for that on those grounds of like not not having a, a system of liberty that's biased towards certain people is definitely a ubiquitous concern in, in issues of justice and social justice. Um, with people who are, you know, treating that sincerely, uh, that debate sincerely. Um, but this one is, is the one that uh, makes more waves. So here's principle two, the maximin principle, the difference principle. Social and economic inequalities are just, they're morally just, only if they result in compensating benefits for everyone, and in particular, for the least advantaged members of society. So here's another quote from Rawls. Social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they both a reason um, they are both a reasonably expected to be to everyone's advantage, and b attached to positions and offices open to all. So what Rawls is saying here is that inequality is okay theoretically it just needs to be justified and in a very particular way there's going to be plenty of other inequalities that are unjust <laughs> um but uh there's uh there's a pattern here and that's the maxi min principle um and he's saying it's not just the aggregate good either here so things like overall market efficiency cannot be used as a justification here we're sensitive about where those benefits are going think back to uh patricia Werhain's uh essay uh, where she's talking about the neem tree and Nemex. And Nemex is able to create an economic efficiency by processing the neem tree leaves and, and making this product out of it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of advantages there about their, the way in which they're refining this resource and making it more efficient. The problem is those benefits are not going to the people uh, who are very, very poor, the indigenous poor, who previously had access to this resource and now they don't once Nemex gets involved. Um, that so the to whom are these uh, these benefits going is also a matter of justice and that's what Rawls is saying here too so the best way to understand the maxim in principle is uh, it's what I got down here in the lecture notes um, imagine it like this so we're in the original position right we're looking at all these um, uh, we're looking at the circumstances of how people have natural inequalities they're not everyone is different um, they're in different natural circumstances of difference. Um, we're not all in the same boat. And also thinking about what are the benefits and burdens of social cooperation and how should we distribute those? How should we set up the rules for this system of, of cooperation in society? Um, if we think about trying to, uh, we're, we're thinking everyone is going to be participating in this system, the first proposal might be well, let's distribute the benefits equally and the burdens equally. So um, imagine, <clears throat> imagine certainly if, if we all had natural equality. Let's just start there. Let's say if we had natural equality, everyone is basically a carbon copy version of every other human when it comes to biology and all that kind of stuff. Okay, And we don't, we're not premising a particular social ordering yet. Um, this is all in the abstract, okay? And then we're like, let's make a society. And let's set up the rules like this. It would make a lot of sense for people to be equally taxed and equally receive the benefits of that taxed money, if we want to think about this in governance terms, okay? Anything else would seem to be unfair um, and arbitrary, okay? Now, um, imagine now that we don't have natural equality, we have natural inequalities. So maybe that means that these benefits and burdens of society should be distributed unequally, but not in terms of giving more power to the powerful and less power to people who have less power. Um, not in this kind of um, 
well, what Rawls kind of calls uh, at one point a calloused meritocracy. Um, instead, he thinks what would be fair, what would get this universal buy-in, is if we think about that baseline of equal distribution of benefits and burdens, like paying your dues and receiving the benefits of those dues, um, we might start thinking about what if we tweak it? What if we distribute the burdens unequally? What if we distribute the benefits unequally? What will happen? Rawls thinks this will not be just unless the result of that inequality is that the people on the very bottom of society are elevated. So we're maximizing the minimum, okay? So if you're imagining being under the veil of ignorance and you're like, I don't know who I am, uh, I might be in the 1%, chances are I'm gonna be in the 99%. If we're, if we're, I'm referencing like current situation in America of like wealth inequality, right? Um, what I, uh, I'm probably gonna be in a lower, I'm not gonna be in the 1%, and what if, what if worst case scenario, what if I'm way at the bottom? What if I have like none of these advantages, I don't have any privilege um, of any kind, I'm like, in, I get the worst luck in terms of where I'm born under my circumstances and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I might wanna hedge my bets here. I might wanna opt, uh, well Rawls thinks we will opt for a system of social cooperation that puts the people at the bottom in the best off position that they could possibly be rather than rolling the dice to try to have ridiculous amounts of power and privilege uh, an unequal benefit or advantage I'm gonna try to hedge the bets and say worst case scenario I'm still as good off as I could possibly be that's the principle that Rawls thinks will justify inequality um, because I'll be in a better off position even if I'm in the worst case I would prefer not an equal situation if it means that I'm able to have more opportunities and able to do more with my life and exercise all the other liberties that I want to in, in the most empowered way that I can. Um, that's what I'm gonna buy in for. Espe especially if that is on the table, I'm gonna prefer it over all the other options that could be proposed. Okay, bye Li Ling, thanks for coming. Good night. Um, so that's the maxi min principle. Um, so Rawls is saying to just say inequality is bad uh, is ignoring a lot of the benefit that the people on the bottom could have. The people who are in the worst off position in that inequality. Their situation could maybe be improved. And why might this be true? Well, for some really basic reasons we can definitely think about. Um, for example, uh, take something like, um, well, we'll get into this stuff with Marxism uh, next week with Cohen. but. Think about how Marx is always really preoccupied with who owns the means of production, right? Who's in control of the factories and the, uh, the basic raw materials that society then tr transforms into in its economy. Um, who's got that kind of power? Um, one of the reasons why capitalism makes a case for itself, contrary to communism or, or, or like state-run communism, I should say, um, is that by having only some people in control of that, they're able to manage it more efficiently rather than having to get everyone involved on every decision that's ever made. I mean, for all, for all of us to have sort of the equal opportunity to have a share in social governance is gonna create a untenable model. It's why America is a democratic republic instead of a pure democracy. We can't have a referendum on every single government decision. We already have enough of a problem getting agreement among Congress, uh, much less if every uh, if we had to vote on everything with e every citizen weighing in. So um, it, it might be more efficient to have an unequal distribution of these sorts of uh, opportunities and some of the power of society, whether that's governmental power, whether that's control the means of production, or other kinds of social opportunities. Most of the resources that society has to offer is not money. A lot of them are just opportunities. Um, like um, who gets to be the astronaut, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, right? Um, not everyone can do that. Uh, and we're gonna prevent some people from having those opportunities for the sake of others. Hedinger brought this up when he said, we already are comfortable with judging people based on involuntary characteristics um, for the sake of efficiency. Similar kind of thing that Rawls is talking about here. Um, I think that there's a lot to be said for this maximin principle. 
um, and a justification of inequality because it's not inequality that doesn't get that isn't um, taking into account everyone's voice and what their interests are. Um, if we're able to create a system of inequality that works to everyone's advantage, especially those on the on the on the very bottom, um, then we we've got a win-win all across the board. I mean, that's another way to think about what Rawls is trying to do here with these basic principles of social justice is create a true win-win for everybody. The biggest win that everyone could hope for. Um, that is going to be the just society. Okay, so um, that's uh, that's a big point here. Rawls does comment on this, and this has been another thing that's been a matter of a great debate. Rawls, Rawls's book, um, uh, Justice is Fairness, and he has another, he has another book, uh, Theory of Justice. But um, this was, Rawls's work was like one of the most influential works on social justice in the 20th century. It, it's a major, major uh, uh, philosophical contribution. It's not the only one, and, it's, and it should not be taken as like the final word on social justice debates, not by a long shot. Um, but there's, uh, there's a reason why um, it definitely has a lot of conversation around it, and it has elicited a ton of conversation and controversy. Um, that's like especially why not to treat it as like the final word because there's a lot of dispute about what's going on in here. But Rawls does propose that he thinks a total welfare state would be unattractive to those in the original position. And a big reason for this is that he thinks the liberty considerations are going to be massive. Even if the people on the bottom would be elevated to a, the most maximum position they could have by being in this kind of like big brother welfare state, he doesn't think people are going to go down for that because of all the other values we have on liberty. <laughs> so he thinks liberty wins out here. Um, but when it comes to everything else um, about uh, how these opportunities, these benefits and burdens, the, the sort of uh, consequential side of uh, the system of cooperation, uh, he thinks that's when Maxi Min is going to take into effect and have a big effect and have a big effect. Um, Rawls does think that um, the principles of liberty here don't mean a kind of libertarianism where you've got this unregulated jungle of the free market where people are definitely going to fall through the cracks. And why is that? Um, that's going to, that's this the kind of quote I want to leave you on here. Okay. So, um, Given the above, uh, everything we've talked about so far, I say in my lecture notes here, injustice can be defined as inequalities that are not to the benefit of all, especially not to the benefit of the people at the very bottom of society. Um, I, I like what he says here. Natural dis distributions are neither just nor unjust. You aren't somehow morally subject to blame for having some natural advantages or having some natural disadvantages. You don't deserve to be rewarded or punished for either one of those things. Um, it's where social institutions interact with those facts and what significance they assign to them. That's where we get justice issues. And Rawls is proposing that the Maxi Min principle is the just way of responding to inequality. Um, you still have to be concerned about universal buy-in, even when people are in unequal circumstances and might not be able to leverage power over everybody else, which is what you get in a libertarian sort of system. The people who have the natural advantages are able to leverage them against the people who don't have them. So Rawls says, we do not deserve our fate. We do not deserve our natural advantages. He said, and this is a really interesting idea for think, thinking about things in the framework of social justice. This might sound really familiar with uh, Hedinger and Pojman's debate. Um, desert, whether you deserve something in the sense of justice, you're you're entitled to it in terms of a moral principle. That happens after we have figured out what is socially just, not before. You don't use desert as a way to figure out what is just. You figure out what's just first, and that's what defines what you deserve in society and what you don't. Okay, so entitlement itself is defined by the standards of this arrangement of social cooperation. It's not natural. It's not a natural property. Um, Nozick's going to have some different things to say about entitlement. But that's Rawls's position. And it's kind of a compelling one, I think. Um, so Rawls denies that one's naturally entitled 
to what one's got from one's natural advantages. Remember Pojman's point here about the gift? That maybe I don't deserve the gift, but I deserve whatever I'm able to get out of the gift, right? Through the effort I put into that. That's what I deserve. Rawls, Rawls would say to Pojman this. He would say, Pojman, your analysis is not taking, is not respecting the complexities of what's happening with the system of cooperation that empowers and enables you to do something with that gift. So I, I really love this quote um, from Rawls. I think this sums up almost like everything about the spirit of what he's doing and how he's approaching this, uh, this thinking about social justice. He says, the more advantaged representative person cannot say that they deserve and therefore have a right to a scheme, a system of cooperation in which they're permitted to acquire benefits through that system in ways that do not contribute to the welfare of others. Okay, so Rawls is saying to someone who has, let's say, natural advantages, however you want to define that, natural power, like the jungle, strong, survive kind of thing. The people who have those natural advantages, um, it's not like they that's a problem inherently and that it's unjust for them to have an advantage over anyone else. He's not, he says that doesn't make any sense. The natural distributions of strengths and weaknesses and, and just circumstances, whatever they are, is not a matter of justice itself. What is a matter of justice is the system of cooperation that would let those things mean something. Remember back to my analogy with disability. It's not just a matter of what's going on with the individual. It's the individual coupled with every, with all the rest of the environment that uh, adds significance to those individual traits of their circumstances. It's both. You need both terms of the equation for anything to make sense here. And um, Rawls would say Pojman's missing half of that equation when he's making that argument. Um, I might have a natural advantage, and I'm in. I'm not, I mean, Rawls wants to say I'm not entitled, but even if he was comfortable to say, yeah, you're entitled to that. I mean, it's not a moral problem for you to have that advantage. That doesn't mean that you deserve a system that lets you leverage that power over other people. Because that system only works if everyone else is playing it. Um, sometimes when I've talked about this idea in like a five-minute version with a student, just being like, hey, Rawls has got a cool idea that's relevant to the discussion we're having. <clears throat> I sometimes like to just frame it like this. It's an illusion to think that even free market capitalism is an unregulated system. It is a regulated system. There's a system of cooperation happening just by having a monetary system. If you have money at all, that dollar that's in your hand only means something because everyone else is playing a game with certain rules that allow that thing to mean something. So for example, if I take a bunch of Monopoly money uh, to um, the store and try to buy some groceries, they're going to be like, nope, uh, we don't uh, accept that currency. We don't play by those rules. We're not playing Monopoly right now. Um, we're playing with U.S. currency or maybe some other foreign currency I've got or a credit card or something like that, right? Um, that's the game that we're playing. And that game only works if everything is, if everyone else is playing along with it. Um, the, the, I mean, the, the way in which money doesn't have any intrinsic value to it is sometimes thrown immediately in our face when we start thinking about extreme situations like the Great Depression and massive inflation. Um, a dollar can mean no, pretty much nothing, or it could mean quite a lot. But either way, whatever uh, is it, its value is getting determined by does rely on everyone else playing by the same rules. So if someone has a bunch of these natural advantages, and then, uh, like, let's, let's just take something like inheritance, right? Um, your parent, you're born into a family. Parents had a lot of money. They give you access to that money as a way of building up your life. Um, do you deserve that money? No. Do you not deserve it? No. I mean, dessert just doesn't make sense here. Rawl says. Um, but does that mean that because you were born with all this money, that you deserve everyone else in society? playing by certain rules that let you lever leverage those circumstances amongst o over them? No, it doesn't at all. Um, that's what Rawls would say. And he thinks that's a very, very intuitive reflection to make. Um, it's what we have control of when we're talking about systems of social justice is not people's natural circumstances. What we have control over 
is setting up the rules of that system of cooperation. That's what we have control over. And the only way that's going to be just according to Rawls is if we can propose a system of cooperation where everyone has a reason to participate. And not some like, we're just going to throw you a bone. Because if we're starting from a position of fairness, where we're not being coerced into agreeing and consenting to a system just because we're so powerless relative to other people, we're not going to buy into any system other than the one that elicits that maximum buy-in. If there's another proposal here where I'm not just getting thrown a bone, but I'm actually, my interests are being considered just along everyone else's just as equally, morally speaking, that's something that I can buy in. And that's the only thing you're going to get buy into. So that's Rawls's theory uh, in a nutshell here. Uh, it still took an hour and 45 minutes, um, so it's a little shorter. But um, I, I, I guess I took some extra time here to try to explain it in more depth. I, I think I've from teaching Rawls in the past, I've seen him get misunderstood a lot. Um, and I hope that my detailed explanation here and maybe beating a dead horse at, at times uh, has served to try to prevent some of those misconceptions and misunderstandings. But if you've got questions about it, please let me know. And I'm I'm especially interested in the criticism. Um, like I said with Li Ling at the beginning of the video, um, I'm, I was hoping for that kind of feedback in this lecture because I think it helps to uh, detect whether there are possible misconceptions out there and then to try to uh, uh, correct them. Um, so let me know. Um, I know you're really busy with a lot of other stuff right now, but even if uh, that conversation happens at the end, after the quarter is all over during summertime, I'd love to have it with you. I think the uh, agree or disagree with him, Rawls has got a very interesting way of looking at it. Um, and just the, I think he's doing a good job of framing, even if you disagree with him, of framing what this debate is all about how we approach um, thinking about social justice from a theoretical point of view rather than just uh, advocating for particular policies. Okay, um, for the code word tonight, let's do... Hmm, what would be a code word? I usually just look at the nearest thing that's around me. Um, Um, we'll just have the moon. The moon will be the code word tonight um, from the from my little version of the original position thought experiment. Okay, um, stay in touch with me about them papers, and uh, uh, definitely I hope the research is going well. If you're really hitting a block with the research, talk to me. I've been talking with a lot of people about that topic in particular recently. And I really think that fillpapers.org is one of the best ways to track down and identify papers that you're interested in. But to actually acquire them, you are going to have to use the Bellevue College uh, Library uh, Research um, Portal, um, which I uh, sent, made an announcement about, uh, just as a reminder in case you're, you're not uh, familiar with that or haven't used it before, or maybe have forgotten because it's been a little while since you've done a research paper. I had some people tell me they're in that boat. Um, but he I'm here to help. Friday deadline is really a hard deadline for this uh, draft. Um, and the reason is to be respectful of all of your peers uh, and your own time for being able to complete the last assignment for the quarter, which absolutely must be done by the following Friday. So that the response paper thing. So um, let's talk about it if you're like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to hit that deadline. I just know it. Um, I really want you to push for that. If there's some kind of emergency or something like that, though, Let's talk about it. Let's try to figure that uh, figure out some plan B. It's not going to be ideal. Any any delay is not going to be ideal. But uh, of course, if if there are extreme circumstances that happen, like like for example, like you get in a car accident or something, of course we're going to be able to make something work. You're not going to fail the class because of something like that. But I, I want it to be a, a kind of it'd have to be a serious case of exigency for a late paper to be kind of appropriate here. Uh, we really want to hit this deadline. Um, okay. Uh, more on that, um, more more on social justice on Thursday uh, with Nozick, which will give a very, very different idea, and he'll be actually in direct conversation with Rawls. Rawls and Nozick are kind of natural opponents and, uh, and have been um, touchstones for a major debate for the last 35 years. I mean, it's been, been, been a lot of time. Okay, I'll see you around. <laughs>